My journey has been one of returning from the darkness and stepping out into the light once more. I'm Chance Lunsford. I'm also Logos and Trivial. While you're sitting trying to figure that out, this is my podcast. Allegedly. Logos and Trivial podcast. I'm Chance Lunsford. I'm also Logos and Trivial. Maybe you're also Logos and Trivial. While you're sitting there trying to figure out what that even means, let me introduce today's special guest. I have with me the man. The myth, the haircut, Mike Elias. <laughs> uh, what are you now, talking Mike about? Is... Cuts. <laughs> the, or no lack cuts of cut. Here. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> hey, man, I used to have hair about that long, maybe even longer. It's tough to tell because of how curly it is, but I, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm hip to that. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So, so look, I, I ran into Mike on Twitter and one of the things that impressed me about you, Mike, is um, you have a way of conveying ideas which makes very complex ideas very easy to understand through the use of infographics or just your communication style seems to be one that uh, synthesizes or condenses com- complexity into simplicity. And that's something that is a very valuable skill and a pretty uncommon one. And, uh, you know, we haven't had a great deal of back and forth, but, uh, from the, from the stuff that we've had, I I think that, uh, one of the ideas that seems central to me is the idea that education has a lot of room for improvement and there's a lot of maybe new ways of conveying information that haven't been taken advantage of yet in the broader education system. And that's something that you seem to be working pretty hard to rectify. Um, and, and that's really what kind of drew me to, to bring you on and talk to you, uh, among other things, but that's the primary reason. Um, so with that sort of very vague introduction, why don't you jump in and tell them a little bit more about who you are and what you do and we can, uh, we can take her from there. Sure. Uh, I'm Michael Elias and I'm the founder of idea markets. And we are building markets for credibility. So in the same way that you have stock markets for the value of companies, we're building markets for public trust in publishers. So we're creating this new player in the power structures and the incentive structures of media and the creation of common knowledge. That's, a, that's the, you know, the elevator pitch sized intro, I guess you could say. With respect to education, there definitely could be some overlaps. One thing I remember saying about education, which is, is not the like, center point of, of what I'm working on, uh, but in the information age, with, where everybody has access to the history of the world's knowledge in their pocket, the difference that makes the difference, the difference that separates the really successful people from everybody else is not access to superior knowledge the way it may have been in previous eras. Now the difference that makes the difference is psychological health, the ability to live uh, and think independently and work with discipline and adjust to changes, uh, to be creative, to overcome obstacles and pains and convert them into benefits. Uh, So I feel that psychotherapy has this role to play that education used to play. Uh, Education for all may not be as fruitful as psychotherapy for all, for example, uh, Mm -hmm. anymore. And I'm kind of, I'm kind of, you know, excited and jazzed about that. It seems, it seems like a long shot that society, this giant, uh, giant ship that's on a course with all its momentum will make such a radical turn. Uh, but I think naturally people are coming to these conclusions um, as people lose faith in college and gain faith in various kinds of self-development and you know, introspection, meditation practices, things like that. Hmm. People who have been following me for some time know that what you just said is particularly of interest to me because um, I had to, I had to uh, get inside my brain and, and clean out a lot of garbage and 
replace it with a lot of useful things in order for me to be able to uh, pull myself out of some places I didn't want to be in and put myself into a place that I'm glad to be in. And uh, I know there's sort of a, there's sort of even still, especially in the masculine world, an idea that um, the psychological realm should be mastered by oneself without any sort of outside help. But um, I don't know, I'm a pretty manly dude and I needed some help. Uh, And I've often found that to be the case. And, And those who sort of fail to recognize their own psychological frailness in the areas where they are weak and don't pick up the tools or the help or, or whatever it is that they need to, to buffer those weak zones. Um, they more often than not tend to have some significant drawbacks as a result of that. And I guess I'm wondering from that perspective, where, where do you think the leverage point or points or the main places where there's some room in the immediacy. And I'm, I'm talking in the next couple of years, say to, to be able to significantly shift that perspective and significantly uh, open up people's willingness or, or sort of shift that perspective to be able to um, have that dream of psychotherapy for all, I guess, uh, be a more realistic goal based on the, the sort of psychological milieu that, that exists. Yeah. Um, man, there are definitely several points along this. Uh, I have kind of a funny definition of psychotherapy. That's not really a definition, just sort of a casual, uh, reference. And that is psychotherapy is salesmanship of difficult truths. Hmm. So whether you do that in a therapist's office is, is one option and a great option that I will defend here, I'm sure. Uh, or whether you find yourself in an industry or in a situation that requires truth seeking and where you are motivated to seek difficult truths for yourself. Uh, because you can, there's kind of a menu. There's a menu of truths out there. You can do the fast food, the drive through, where you just kind of get what's convenient. It's right in front of your face. And, you know, you pay a price for it. Or you can uh, get, you know, the, the catch of the day. And it, you don't know what it's going to be. And you have, and you have to inquire within. Uh, and that's a pun. Like you meditate, you introspect. You look for it. You don't know what the price is going to be. <laughs> yeah. Just explaining for the people who don't have this on video. Uh, that, uh, yeah, there's, there's this spectrum of possible levels of curiosity, right? And uh, in the absence of a context that is specifically for uh, discovering and coming to peace with difficult truths, um, the incentives around those, the incentives around uh, preferring understanding or prioritizing understanding over comfort or over uh, fear of rejection or something like that. Uh, These are the kinds of factors that can accelerate this kind of shift without requiring any institutional cooperation. Mm. Does that kind of make sense? Yes. I don't know if you are aware, but I wrote a book called Uncommon Mentality. And that's a book that asks you to work big time. And and in the book, I I even say, before I get into any of the stuff I am teaching that, look, this isn't, I don't, I don't want to tell you what to do. I'm just offering you some tools. I've used them. I've used them on other people. I've seen it. I've seen them work their magic, but you have to do the work. It's writing, it's visualization skills, it's it's building in psychological triggers. You know, the idea, uh, a large part of the idea is you you have emotional triggers already. And usually those emotional triggers are from trauma or from um, extreme events. And a lot of times they work to your detriment, but you have the facility to create these things inside of you intentionally. 
And if you can do it correctly, then they can work to your advantage. So instead of being triggered off the rails, you can be triggered to go even faster on the rails, that kind of thing. And But that kind of work takes work. Writing takes work. Asking yeah. yourself questions and being honest and answering them and going back through your life and looking at the things that led up to where you are and being honest about those, that all takes work. It all takes time. But the end result of a process that takes work and guides you down these paths where you have tools that um, work for you rather than against you is that you now live yeah. a life where you have these these bulwarks and these buffers and these um, boosts that can help you to advance whatever it is that you're doing. And I don't, you know, I'm big on personal sovereignty. I'm big on self-direction. I'm big on these things because uh, that's just who I am. I, I never wanted anybody to tell me what to do, just how to do what I was seeking. And, and, and I, that's, that's the gift I'm trying to give other people. And I guess um, that kind of leads me into a question about, credibility because that's that's a big part of what you're doing and i'm wondering yeah. how do you see these two worlds of psychological well-being and credibility meshing where the, yeah. where are the bridges where are they sort of connecting and how how does that move your sort of broader vision forward okay so let's start with some background as uh, as I heard, I've, I've heard you discuss before, the the narrative landscape is very much governed by these monolithic institutions that don't really have any mechanism for losing status, no matter how grievously wrong, or how misleading, or how often they're grievously wrong and misleading. These huge institutions are they maintain their status as arbiter of legitimacy for public narratives. Grandma will not listen to you unless the New York Times says what you want to say. Uh, so the battle that is being fought between uh, nations, cultures, between sets of narratives is sort of played out on the minds of everybody else. And since since there's no accountability, since there's no reckoning, since there's nothing to punish or replace uh, a media institution that fails to actually serve the public, serving the public is not really a high priority. They have this power to create narratives uh, however suits their interests, or that, whether that be shareholder interests, government interests, like if, uh, if the New York Times depends on you know, access to the White House or something, uh, then they'll do what the White House says or the White House will kick them out. And that's a little bit extra true in this administration, but there are these sorts of dependencies uh, and political status games of various kinds. Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post. I mean, how much more explicit can you get? Uh, so there's this enormous conflict of interest between the shapers of public narratives and the people who have to live with them and the people who have to argue within them. Mm -hmm. So because, because of this abuse of the public mind, the public is kind of in a state of constant trauma and gaslighting. It's like a little kid that's been brought up in a an unhealthy household and all they know is what they've been told their whole lives. These are the same brand names that were educating their parents and grandparents. And there's not really an ingrained basis for doubt. And there's not really even an ingrained motive for doubt. You have to be particularly motivated. You have to have the luxury of, of, sitting down and going, man, you know, I really just want to do my own research on this one. And millions of working people are just trying to get by. And millions of working people don't have the luxury of knowing there's a problem. They're having their buttons pushed on Facebook all the time, provoking outrage, signaling against each other and for each other. Uh, there's just this hot mess of delusion that has been engineered 
by these institutions that have no mechanism for replacement. So because of that, the need for therapy is very much tied in with the abuse of credibility that has been going on for decades, if not centuries in our culture. So is that a good start? Very good. Yes. Cool. Okay. So on the one hand, um, there, well, let me, let me step back a little bit here for a second too, because okay. I do have more to say on that, but go, go ahead. Sure. And, and I'm sure this will, this will lead right into it or, or give Great. you plenty of opportunity to, to jump in because awesome. what I'm, what I'm sort of thinking about or what I was thinking about as you were talking is you do have these uh, sort of hyperbolic media organizations and this very hyperbolic and reactionary government system. And I suspect that many of the participants in these organizations or systems didn't understand necessarily, especially at first that the psychological toll that is being taken on the populace that's being exposed to these things was going to be so significant and was going to lead to so much division and so much chaos and so much uh, sort of anger and hatred and, and this, this brewing cauldron of, of, you know, angst and anger and, and increasingly leaning towards bloodshed, which is not great. But I suspect some of the people knew that all along and that's, that's sort of a whole other can of worms and you can, you can open it if you like or not. And that's kind of up to you, but I guess where do you suppose now that, and this comes back to really kind of one of my first questions is given that there are these momentous media outlets, these momentous governmental systems uh, and this and this game that's been played for so long and has been so corrupted and so infiltrated by all these different special interests and all this greed and all these big players, Jeff Bezos, sure, and and and, uh, and the other you know two or three dozen people across the world just like him, or or groups that are just like him that have their opinions, that have their agendas, and have the understanding and the capability to uh, turn the government mechanism, turn the media mechanism towards their goals and to create this divisionary process that they can then insert the answers that they already have prepared off in the wings to be like, well, here's your solution to this thing. And I, and I planned it that way, I guess, how do you, how do you fight such momentum? How do you, or at least how do you step in and divert some of that stream off into a healthier direction? Yeah. What, uh, that's, that's what, the product I'm building is aiming to do, or the platform I'm building is aiming to do. And I work in the blockchain cryptocurrency industry, which arose out of Bitcoin. I don't know how much overlap your audience has with the Bitcoin crypto uh, industry. Is it a lot or should I kind of- Yeah, I mean, there's, you, you might as well do an explanation though. I think it'll be helpful for people to understand okay. blockchain because there's, cool. there's some older dudes, the gray wave folks that are going to listen to us and be like, oh, what's a Bitcoin? <laughs> awesome, awesome. So other, other than, other than uh, being you know, just a hot meme, a hot topic that's floating around, a blockchain is basically software that is maintained by horcruxes. You know how in Harry Potter, uh, the Voldemort character has all these uh, like little jewelry pieces and stuff that in order to kill him, you have to destroy those because he's like stored his soul in those and they maintain hmm. existence, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, a blockchain is basically software with a distributed uh, center of maintenance so that in order to take down a blockchain or in order to take down software that's operating on a blockchain, you have to destroy all these nodes. And these nodes are maintained by people and organizations in countries and companies that have conflicting interests. So they're not all going to cooperate at the same time and shut everything down. You have people in Iran and China and Russia and the United States and the UK and Bolivia and Israel and Sudan 
who are maintaining the Bitcoin network and the Ethereum network and other blockchain. And at no point in history have they ever uh, you know, agreed. So they're not going to all collude and say, you know what, this thing isn't really so good. It's a, it's a mechanism for uh, creating trust across national ideological cultural lines because uh, there's no central party that has enough control over it to affect it unilaterally. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, almost uh, taking the idea of uh, hegemony of uh, money or, or political power and turning it on its head and saying our, our, our hegemony is going to be one of trust. That's going to be the ruling ideological uh, sort of narrative is I have to be able to trust you. And the reason I can trust you is because I can verify because there's consensus across the nodes, yeah. across the ideological and national divides. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. The software is just so diversely maintained uh, that it's impossible to say, oh, you're not telling the truth because you're just controlling it. There's nobody in particular controlling it. We all all together are controlling it. Uh, and we all have different, different interests that intersect and oppose in different ways. So uh, you can also think of it like Napster in the same way that uh, you know, the record companies couldn't keep people from sharing digital files through Napster. There's just this sort of unstoppability that comes from a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, network. The, the, the metaphor isn't perfect at all, but what you get out of that is the sense that there's no big company or government that can step in and stop what you're doing without literally like killing the whole internet, which is just not going to happen. So Bitcoin is special as a special kind of money because it is maintained in that way. There are 21 million of them, period. There's never going to be more. And the whole world cooperates in maintaining the network. Ethereum is a different kind of blockchain that enables software programs to be built on it. So you can basically build a copy of Facebook that Mark Zuckerberg doesn't control or can't be censored or where instead of uh, Facebook stockholders getting paid when people buy ads, the users get paid when people buy ads. In fact, such things already exist, but nobody cares because people like Facebook and because the Ethereum network is not quite robust enough to handle zillions of, of transactions a second the way the uh, Facebook one does. It takes, takes a lot of uh, processing power to maintain these blockchains. So that's a an overview of the infrastructure on which my product is built. I want to make clear that it's not a company that a government uh, can step in and say, we don't want you to exist anymore, goodbye. Uh, and it's not something that, you know, a private server host like Amazon or Alibaba can say, the government's putting pressure on us to shut you down, so we're going to shut you down. It's, uh, it's, more, it's more unkillable than that because it's in a blockchain. So the software that we've written for a blockchain uh, is basically a stock market protocol that uses stock market incentives, uh, both speculation and income, to rank public faith in the attention worthiness of a domain or of a publisher. So if you have New York Times and you have Breitbart and you have logosentrificopodcast.com, you have basically everything, Joe Rogan competing on the same playing field and measured by the same metric, which is capital risk. In order to move you up the list, you have to buy, buy a token. You have to buy a digital vote. And the price of a digital vote increases the more there are in circulation. So there's actually some capital risk involved. If you buy high and then the people who bought before you sell, you could lose your money. So the way this ultimately works is that the publications that earn the trust of their audience can crowdsource the cost of a high rank. Joe Rogan has a lot of people who listen to him because they want to, not because he's a big brand name, 
and on TV and has a fancy studio and, you know, pretty blonde ladies. Uh, he doesn't have, doesn't have, <laughs> which no problem with that, by the way. Um, Joe Rogan is kind of in this dark, dark side of, of the media world. What's not, commonly known is his audience is about the size of the entire CNN network. So he is playing on the same field in terms of influence size that they are. But you don't see Joe Rogan on Wall Street trending right next to CNN. There's no common platform where the public can see its own preferences reflected back to it. So by putting Joe Rogan and CNN on the same marketplace, on the same standard of of measurement, we can allow them to compete fairly for the trust of the public uh, in a completely new way. Does that make sense? Sure. All right. It I want does. to add one last detail before we yeah, move on in. because I just jump realized in, yeah. I forgot something. So the publishers who can earn the trust of their audience, like Joe Rogan, can inspire a crowdsourcing of a high ranking in the marketplace, which costs money and involves risk. Meanwhile, the companies that merely want to control public opinion, they want to have the appearance of credibility and of trust, uh, but don't necessarily want to do anything good with it, have to buy a high ranking out of pocket. So the fakers lose money and the earners of trust make money and get this high ranking. And so there becomes this vast profitability difference between the publishers who genuinely earn the trust of their audience and those that wish to exploit the appearance of trust, that wish to fake it because they have to buy a high ranking themselves. Does that kind of make sense? It does. And I, I guess um, the obvious question here, and I'm sure this is one that you get a lot, is um, how do you convince people to use your platform? There are a number of ways to do this. One, there's a very strong activist thesis. There's no uh, mechanism like this for spreading a point of view. For example, if you take political campaign donations, you never get your money back and it stops mattering after the election. And maybe the purpose that you're donating to will be distorted by media or the person won't follow through on it once they're in office. There are lots of risks and not a lot of, um, not a lot of solidity. It's very just, you know, putting money toward a hope, living on a prayer. Uh, by contrast with idea markets, they, the votes that you buy, the voice that you express in capital risk matters any time after the election or not and not only can't be uh, subverted or ignored by corporate legitimate media, it redefines what legitimate media is. So there's no barrier between the will of the public and the reflection of the will of the public in this open platform. As long as the will of the public is moderated through people who don't really care what it is, we have no way of, of organizing or recognizing how much strength and how much, uh, what our priorities really are. If you have seen the movie A Bug's Life, there's the scene where Grasshopper says, those ants outnumber us 100 to 1. And if they ever figure that out, there goes our way of life. Well, that's the situation we're in right now. And Idea Markets is a medium for the public to figure out its own voice and its own power. Does that make sense? Sure. It's, um, you know, it goes back to the old idea of the silent majority. The most vocal and the most uh, sort of extreme opinions or perspectives are the ones that get the most attention while the Joe Schmo or the working class or, or whatever sort of group that comprises the actual majority, very rarely do they have the ability to have their collective voice heard. And so yeah. when the extremities of society get very vocal, and especially if momentum in the media or, or in the government or any of these other mechanisms of communication or, or shifting of power uh, tilt to one end 
of the extreme or the other, then people will feel like, well, maybe I'm the odd man out. Maybe I'm the one who hasn't thought about things deeply enough. And so I'll just go along with what appears to be the actual uh, sort of democratic majority, which I I have some thoughts about democracy that are not necessarily common, but uh, when it comes to being able to give voice, yeah, yeah. When it comes to being able to give voice to that silent majority, just like in Bugs Life or sometimes it seems to me to be the case that it needs to be automated for them because if you're not inclined to be a spokesperson even for your own opinion because you don't like controversy or you're too busy or you're worn out or you got three kids and a job and um, you haven't maybe you're not sure about one issue or another, but you know what you like, you like Joe Rogan or you, you know, you like CNN or, you know, heaven forbid, <laughs> whatever, but yeah. whatever you like, um, there need, there needs to me, or it seems to me that you might need to be able to have that be factored in for you in a way. And so I guess it sounds like, uh, that's kind of what is happening with these idea markets is it simplifies it simplifies a person's ability to have their opinion heard without having to be an influencer or a, or a great orator or uh, some sort of content producer. They can just live the life that they're living. And then with a simple step, they can make their voice heard in a meaningful way. Is that kind of, am I understanding yeah, correctly? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Precisely. We want to make it very simple and straightforward for people to signal trust in a way that cannot be ignored. Hmm. Okay. so. If I go to the podcast rankings right now, yeah, um, Joe Rogan is going to be consistently top three, let's say. Probably, um, probably because he's huge and uh, actually uh, deserves his uh, spot. Yeah, and he's he's something like two billion views and and downloads a year, which is sure. s- something else. <laughs> but oh yeah, but I'm not going to see CNN podcast near the top of that unless it's because there's a cult of personality behind somebody like a, you know uh wolf blitzer or something uh but radio lab was is a podcast right. that finds a lot of stuff and you know they're through npr but they're also kind of their own thing and i actually went to a live show of theirs one time and that that jad album rod and robert crow put on a show and when jad's working those controls live and it's it's like whoa dude you that is a very special skill um so i guess what i'm getting at there is outside of the monetary thing outside of the uh, sort of verified credibility there is sort of already a mechanism for ranking the public's interest in a particular person or idea through the content that they absorb and i guess i'm wondering how do you um suggest that your platform differs from that and is also superior yeah um that definitely is another way to measure content you just look and see how many times something has been downloaded um this is the first time I've, I've heard this question. And with most, most kinds of alternative statistics like this, the answer is because it doesn't cost anything to do that, it can be manipulated. Uh, and I suspect that the only reason it's not manipulated today is that uh, those statistics don't end up influencing uh, who is the arbiter of legitimacy. So Joe Rogan has this massive audience and yet does not feel like a threat to CNN. And if for some reason the podcast downloads statistic became a central focal point for deciding who is the powerful voice, CNN or Joe Rogan, then I think CNN would you know, spin up a bunch of computers in a warehouse and download their own podcast 50 million times a day and game those numbers. Does that kind of make sense? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So 
another question I have is a company on Wall Street is incentivized to go public because then they get an influx of capital. Yeah. If, if I'm in, if I'm a podcaster and I am on the idea market, do I see an influx of capital because I'm on there because people have bought my influence token? Uh, you, you probably do, but actually this also leads in very well with another answer to your question. Why will people use this platform? And that is the current major business models for journalism are ads, which require you to get page views and donations, which require you to appeal to a very narrow set of people who give you money and keep them happy. And subscriptions, which require you to auto, uh, artificially limit your circulation. You don't actually get to reach as many people as you might otherwise. So each of those major business models is in conflict with doing the best job that you can as a journalist. If you need to get page views, you want to create clickbait and outrage and get shares on social media from people going, how dare you, blah, 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 blah. If you want to get donations, as I mentioned, you have to appeal to your base, your most passionate people who will keep you uh, fed and with donations. And if you want to get subscriptions, you can't speak to literally everybody. You have to uh, find some balance between uh, getting publicity and keeping people out unless they pay. So what Idea Markets does is it realigns the incentives between journalists to do the best job that they can and earn trust and speak to everybody and also to be compensated in proportion to how well they do that job. So the, the traditional business models of, of media today and publishing sort of peel apart, sort of fork apart the goals of getting money and doing a great job. And Idea Markets reunites them because the more trust you earn, the more of a high ranking you can crowdsource, the more apparent credibility you have. And that leads to more page views, which is more ad revenues, and more subscriptions, which is more revenues, and more donations, which is more revenues. So uh, all of the typical business models can coexist with this, but the capital gains that you get from earning a high ranking and the increased visibility and legitimacy that you get from earning a high ranking uh, is another source of income and bolsters your income and sort of unites the job of a journalist, the seeking of truth and the informing of the public with the compensation of the journalist, which comes directly as a signal of earning trust from the audience. Does that make sense? It does. Um, Great. Okay. So to keep going with the parallel of Wall Street, right now, if you are a major player in Wall Street, you are using supercomputers and proximity of a mile makes a difference because of the speed of light. <laughs> yeah, and these AI yeah. algorithms are, are trading at such volume and with such rapidity that what the market looks like is entirely inhuman, especially at the larger scales. I mean, you can sit at home and you can keep an eye on a stock and, and trade at the peaks and the valleys. And you can make a pretty good individual living if you have some understanding and you're willing to assume some risk. But most of that market is dominated by algorithmic supercomputer situations. How then would you prevent a similar situation from arising on the idea markets where um, somebody has $10 billion to invest in credibility markets and uses a supercomputer and an algorithm to trade at such massive volume and floods the market with, with all this kind of stuff and plays games with itself to, to play games with the capital influx that's coming in into the idea markets. Got you. 
I feel like I have two answers to this. One is the way a market works is it gives you a profit opportunity when something is mispriced. So the concept of a market is no different in credibility than it is in equities. If we still believe that markets can provide a fair uh, approximation or relative approximation of the value of a share of a company, there's no reason we can't expect those same principles to do the same for credibility, uh, regardless of who's playing the game. Uh, of course, at the beginning, there will be more volatility and more noise and less signal just until the market matures. That's to be expected, and there's not really a way to go from zero to 100 without passing through that phase. But the, the principles aren't really any different. Um, second, those high-frequency traders, I actually, in my day job, uh, up until recently, my day job was with a firm building 3D trading tech for the public to use to play in the low time frame trading. And the founder is one of the inventors of high frequency trading before it was called that. And he used to run, uh, he used to run a big trading firm and his friend was CTO of one of the big exchanges and their offices were next door and used to run cables through the elevator shaft to get this amazing latency and then cycle through these trades and he wrote like the first <laughs> language for programming algorithmic trading or like it's crazy uh so i have some uh fortunate you know crazy you know inside baseball stories of about about this exact field and my understanding is those high frequency trades are mostly taking advantage of volatility within a narrow range. They're called market makers or liquidity providers. So that if you want to buy, you know, a thousand dollars, well, here's a million dollars that you can buy from. And if you want to sell a thousand dollars, well, here's a million dollars that you can sell from. And these high frequency trading computers basically manage, uh, these sort of margins above and below the active price so that when you and I uh, want to buy little chunks out of the bottom here and out of the top here, the market makers basically get an automatic, easy, no risk profit from the difference between your buy right here and your sell right here. So they're basically taking this no risk, tiny margin play and repeating it a zillion times and providing a context for retail, that's you and me, to, uh, to give them a little bit of our money because we're buying slightly higher and selling slightly lower. And they run both of these pools, basically. So the high frequency trading is not so much manipulating the price, though it can do that to a certain extent. It's more about manipulating the um, taking advantage of the boundaries of the playing field that the price is currently at. If a zillion people want to buy Apple stock, there's only so much that a market maker can do to prevent the stock from going up. Uh, there, there is quite a lot, but, there, but that power is limited. So that's even actually more limited in idea markets because the software that we built basically measures rankings according to total tokens bought from from the software from the decentralized blockchain software so in order for a market maker to have a ton of control over the price range of a of a token they will have to buy from the software in order to manipulate the book within this range but in buying from the software they're increasing the ranking and there's no way around that. There's no way to control uh, supply without first increasing supply. So that's actually one of the key features of idea markets that once, when a token is bought, there is nothing anybody can do to make it seem like it hasn't been. Hmm. Okay. So um, I've been throwing little jabs at your ideas here just to kind of see how 
you know, you would bob and weave and, and see what she had to say. So where are you at right now in the process of, you know, you said zero to 100, uh, where, where is idea markets now compared to where you want it to be? And, and what does the period between where you are now and where you want to be look like? What, what's it going to take to get you there? Yeah. So we have a beta built. We have a prototype built and it operates on the blockchain in this unkillable software that I've mentioned. So in a certain sense, the hard part is done or at least most of the way done. And what we're doing now is raise, raising angel investment so that we can build a very user-friendly experience so that people with no crypto knowledge can immediately use the site and benefit from uh, this protocol, from this mechanism that we've built. So we have been talking to angel investors and funds in the cryptocurrency space in particular. And our goal is to raise $125,000 and launch in September with, uh, with this new front end, with this web experience that we're building. So if you're in the crypto world, the analog would be Coinbase. Coinbase itself is a private company that runs on private servers and is easy to shut down you know, from a governmental standpoint or whatever, they apply, they comply with all the regulations so that that doesn't happen. But what they do is they provide a, an interface, a gateway for transacting with Bitcoin and Ethereum and all these blockchain-based digital assets that are not so easy to shut down. So we're going to do the same thing, basically. We're going to build the coin base of idea markets to make it easy for anybody to use without having to gain any extra technical knowledge. Does that kind of make sense? Yes. And, um, okay. So you hope to launch in September. Yeah. If, if this, uh, first seed round goes according to plan. Um, and once it launches, how will you attract participants? What is, will there be some sort of uh, incentive mechanism to draw them in at first? Or, you know, maybe like you join one of these new fintech companies and they give you five bucks to, to play around with it first. Or I guess I'm just wondering, because this is a novel idea in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. And, and how are you going to build trust in the trust market? Got you. We, in terms of trust at a basic level, we're planning to ensure everything that gets deposited into the, into the platform. There are various uh, blockchain token insurance platforms and products that have started to be born because that seems to me to be the best way to solve this problem of, okay, there are no government shutdown risks, there are fewer fraud risks, but there are these new technical risks. So we're building insurance into the platform so that people don't have to worry that their money might disappear. Uh, and to build trust in the platform and encourage participation, there's actually an aspect of it that I haven't quite described to you yet. I mentioned at the beginning that this is like a stock market in that there is both speculation, you buy low, sell high, and there is also an income potential. And the way that income works is when you buy a token, you're actually depositing your money into a unkillable software contract that lends out cryptocurrency on the other end without any human involvement. And since there's no human involvement, the interest that you can earn by being a lender of your money is higher than a typical bank account. A typical savings account at a bank, you get maybe 1% annually. And on crypto lending platforms like the ones that we use in our back end, it's common to get two to 10 and even above 10% uh, annual interest on crypto deposits. And uh, there are a lot of reasons why that may increase or stay the same for a while while the uh, public adjusts to this new technology. But in any case, when you buy a token, the money that you spend is not going to me, it's not going to us, it's not going to my private company, it's going to this unkillable uh, software 
that manages money by itself without human intervention. So I can't, you know, go in and tamper with it or steal it or block it or anything like that. It goes into this unkillable software that then lends the money out the other side and pays interest. And that interest doesn't go to you. It is pooled and given only to people who buy and have the market winning tokens. So there's an incentive to buy stuff that other people will agree deserves to be at the very top. Because if you're at the very top, you get to benefit from the interest generated by all the purchases on all the rest of the market. So not only do you get this you know, two to 10% that uh, the lending platform creates, you get two to 10% generated by all these people distributed to only these people. So you have this disproportionate interest reward as the first level of incentives for participation. People are going to want to compete to earn this high level of interest, this high level of passive income from the platform. Um, that's level one. And there are several more levels of secret sauce and secret plans to increase even further the interest rewards that people will compete over. And I will tell you one of them right now because it's not that big a secret. It's called a sponsored interest uh, smart contract. So what you can enable someone to do is put a bunch of money into this unkillable software that lends money out the back end pays interest. And then that interest will go where I tell it to. It will go to the market and be distributed to the market as rewards. But this capital, this principle, this money that you put in that contract will not be at risk the way it is in the market typically. So you get to keep your money safe and donate the interest that it earns through the platform to the users as an incentive. Uh, a few months back, there was a kerfuffle between some media organizations and some exchanges in the crypto world. And CZ, the CEO of Binance, one of the biggest exchanges in the world and the fastest unicorn ever, said, I'll donate 100 Bitcoin to an anti-fake news fund. But no such thing has ever existed or really could exist except in a case like this. Uh, because if he donates 100 Bitcoin to our sponsored interest smart contract, A, he doesn't even have to lose the money. He doesn't even have to spend it. He can get it back down the line. And second, his money will go toward generating interest that creates a competition for genuine trust. So I think that's an ideal way to actually fight fake news. And these mechanisms exist to create these inherent incentives for competition, for use. And if I know the crypto industry, uh, they can't resist a little alpha. So I think, I think there'll be quite a lot of playing with this, just like there is any other uh, major exchange. I quite like that. I've, I've often tried to explain just how profoundly powerful the idea of a smart contract will be once it's more commonly implemented. Um, and I, I like those ideas. I think that's cool. And I recently wrote an article just sort of postulating that maybe all these, maybe all these uh, sort of social safety net programs and tax incentivized retirement programs and healthcare and all this stuff doesn't need to go into the general fund, but could just go into an interest bearing account, personal account for you. So if you pay social security money, it just goes into an account. And, and if you wanted to be sort of more That's very smart. I like that socially, uh, you know, socially generous, a portion of the interest that those accounts could generate would bring up the balance of those who maybe haven't earned enough income to meet the minimum viable balance is what I called it. So, yeah. that, uh, and, and then the stability that would be brought about in the banks and in the investment world where there's just trillions of dollars in capital sitting all the time and constantly growing because of these accounts instead of the government just sort of dicking around with it and playing with it and putting it wherever they want. And then just hoping that the, the Ponzi scheme continues to grow until it can't. And then, you know, what are you going to do then? 
I guess you'll send the people out in the streets and have them fight each other and forget about your, <laughs> yes. but I, Hey, Hey, I guess that's a bit. <laughs> I, a bit I like that idea though. Cause I absolutely agree that, uh, one way we can basically ensure everybody's taken care of is by using smart contracts to, uh, voluntarily create these networks that distribute funds where they need to go without any overhead. Um, and the trustless aspect and the permanence really create an opportunity here that we've never had the opportunity to explore. And uh, yeah, I, I really like that idea. It's, it's, it's the kind of idea that I will like write down and talk to friends about and would totally steal if it had come from me. I would steal it from me, but I won't steal it from you. Uh, hey, uh, I just, I I'm of the it. opinion that, that something like that is a, is a situation where I, I don't need the credit. I just, you don't? I, right. I well, just want to see it happen. I'll still give it to you. Yeah. I'll still give it to you. But yeah. I do, I like that so much. <laughs> Develop it a little bit and, and, you know, get it out there a little bit. That's really cool. Um, okay. Well, th that's good. So, so, okay. This conversation is, uh, sort of surprising to me, you know, that's why I, we talked a little bit before we started about, is this going to be a structured conversation or just a sort of free form and, yeah. and where we have gotten to, um, is surprising to me on a lot of levels. Um, and I guess I'm just curious at this point, what have I missed? What are the questions you you don't get asked that you want to be asked. What are the, what are the aspects of, of what you're doing that um, you feel like need to be highlighted that I haven't done a good job of probing into? I think you've done an awesome job. I'm a little surprised too, especially because I didn't expect to be invited to talk about my work to this level of detail and I appreciate it. And uh, it's been very helpful. One thing I will add is you mentioned explaining you know the importance of smart contracts and one of the things that i like to say that i don't feel is appreciated enough in the crypto industry let alone anywhere else is that what smart contracts give us the opportunity to do and what blockchain in general kind of gives us the opportunity to do is to create new incentive mechanisms basically from nothing. It's Plato for incentives. And why is that important? It's important because we can reconcile self-interest with collective benefit so that we can sort of create uh, an incentive mechanism that makes utopia, for lack of a better word, inevitable without requiring any change in human nature. Okay, so this, this brings me sort of full circle to the beginning of the conversation because one of the realms in which I hope to see a lot of change, and I brought it up, is the realm of education. And one of the things I think which is severely lacking is the idea of self-directed learning. Yeah. There, and especially with kids because there's so much of – the way that a person thinks and the and the ability to express oneself and the direction of a person's life that is established in early age. And to be perfectly frank, the modern education system is full of a lot of bullshit. It just doesn't prepare a person to live a life of meaning or prepare them yeah. to have the skills financially, socially, um, professionally to – make it in the world in which we live it's and i'm not sure it really ever did to be honest preparing sure. people to be factory workers is sort of a very limited route to take and when when higher education was actually higher education and it was expensive because you had to pay for the people who were the best of the best to come teach the people who had the means and the and the sort of heritage and the and the possibility of being the best in the best uh, the the sort of democratization of the education system forgot about merit it seems to me to be the case and 
my kids, for example, I mean, they're bright. They're uncommonly bright, uh, but they have their own interests. My oldest daughter loves art. She loves to paint and to draw and she's very good at it. And she, I have tried to instill in my kids the lesson that everything that you love, you should do as often as you can, because that's the only way to get better at it. And if you're very, very good at something, it doesn't matter what it is. If you're very, very good at something, you can find a way to make a living from it. And, you know, I have three daughters and they're all into art, but my oldest daughter is the very most into it. And my middle daughter is sort of developing an interest in art too. And my youngest daughter, she's three, but she dances. She dances all the time and she's got all these moves and things and she just, she loves it. And imagine a world where this idea of trust, this idea of um, validity in an education sense operated under a similar paradigm because uh, if there is a platform out there that said, okay, teachers, do your damnedest to create something that will convey the education that you're trying to convey to the people. And it's, it's you over here and it's you over here and it's you over here, create the content, create the curriculum, um, team up if you want, whatever. And then the students themselves go through and they rate this class and they say, this did an excellent job of teaching me exactly what I wanted. And this one, not so much. And so they are ranked. And then the teachers are incentivized because perhaps there's a, a, a token or perhaps there's some sort of smart contract that based on the credibility of their system or their curriculum, they are paid because you have to pay for the education. And there's a lot of money in education right now, whether it's publicly funded or privately or, or, or however you want to play that game. If the best teachers were rewarded for the best education and students could guide themselves through the avenues that they wanted. Even if you were to have a mandatory curriculum of you have to reach a certain level of mathematics and reading proficiency, but then whatever else you want is you're free to go. And then here's some practicality stuff. Maybe that's the curriculum is you have to have theory and practice and you have to provide your own sort of level of proof. So it's two way street with the credibility. You're credible as a student, you're credible as a teacher. That's what I have been thinking about for education for a long time. And I know that a lot of people have been trying to work towards building something like that. And I guess I wonder your thoughts on how something like the idea markets could be uh, sort of translocated into the realm of education and whether you think that would be a viable way of sort of, um, creating credibility in the education sphere, which has taken a massive, massive dip in credibility over the last, especially the last decade or two. Yeah, absolutely. I think that idea is awesome and uh, really inspiring. And I want to give a lot of thought to how idea markets could best be fit toward that purpose. Um, What I will say is that Idea markets, you've heard, the, you've heard the phrase, the medium is the message, Marsha mm-hmm. McLuhan. The medium that we typically use for truth is facts. There's this paradigm of facts, and you either have the facts or you don't. Uh, meanwhile, the spirit of science is supposed to be that knowledge is tentative. And what we know now is merely the best that we can do. And uncertainty is really an unavoidable thing. There's not really such thing as permanent or undoubtable knowledge. So there's this sort of disjoint between the metaphors that we use to teach our kids and the deep philosophical truths that we know ought to underpin our knowledge generating institutions. So what idea market does is it builds uncertainty into the quest for knowledge. So it becomes less about what the facts are and more about hedging risk, more about risk management, identifying opportunities and dealing with uncertainty because uncertainty more closely reflects the nature of truth and its pursuit and our relation to it as human beings than the idea of facts does and filling someone with the right facts. A market is a question. It's what is the right relationship for all these things? And I think a question is the instrument that we need to lead 
education and society, not answers. We just had a bit of mental synergy there because as you were talking, I was thinking it's not facts, it's questions. Questions are the yeah. key to education. You, you ask a question and that almost necessarily leads to answers. And if you have one question at the front of your mind or a couple of questions which center around, are you sure? about that am i sure about this what i think is true is it can i prove it is there an instance where it isn't true uh, probably <laughs> yeah, yeah. so how can i how can i get an answer to that uh, that's i've i've often played this game on twitter the question of the day and i just ask you a tricky question and then if somebody answers i just keep asking them questions until they start repeating themselves or i get bored or they just get mad at me um, and i you know the Socratic method is a very intense way of teaching somebody because when you have to come up with the answers yourself, you discover that you have a great deal of the knowledge that you were seeking. You just didn't necessarily understand. And to have somebody guide you through questions and make you answer them, uh, it just sort of helps you mentally connect dots that maybe you didn't see the the threads connecting, but then that little impulse connection, you go, oh, this is a node and this is a node. And this is part of a web. And oh man, now I can see this whole other web. It's like a, I just entered the paradigm and every once in a while a question will open up a, a, whole, a whole higher paradigm to you. And then you go, oh wow, the world looks totally different to me now. And I think for a lot of people, blockchain, smart contracts, cryptocurrency, that has been a major paradigm shifter for people because they realize, well, you know, I read the creature from Jekyll Island. This, this federal reserve situation is monstrous. And how, but how, how the hell do we get out of this mess? Oh, Hey, look at this. And, and, and you know, it's not guaranteed by any means. I mean, I know there's a lot of uh, sort of crypto enthusiasts out there who think that it's just, a guaranteed matter of time, but there's so much tumultuous chaos in the culture and in the world at large that things have to go a certain way for this sort of uh, digital asset situation to be viable. Um, and I, I guess I wonder, I guess I wonder from your perspective, what do you, suppose will happen to ideas like yours should this chaotic situation, this turbulence disrupt some of the major institutions like say the United States of America or um, the current world order in such a drastic way that the world does not look significantly like it looks today because a lot of these institutions were built for a world that existed 200 years ago or 100 years ago or 50 years ago, and the world doesn't really look similar in many respects to that world. And we're seeing a lot of the ramifications of that. And I suppose I'm wondering if you feel like idea markets or some of these other things will have the resiliency required to make it through the transitionary period of a tree falling in the forest, and then there's a light and there's this serious period of competition where things are going to be trying to eat each other in order to, to absorb the light. And I, and I wonder what's your take on that? Yeah. I can't pretend to know how things are going to shake out. However, if uh, the internet stays intact, if Elon Musk's Starlink satellites end up providing global internet that does not depend on, you know, things down on earth not blowing up, uh, then there's a, there's a chance for people in any situation are always going to need and desire information and institutions and powerful interests will always be trying to manipulate information. And if there's the technical means for idea markets to survive and be useful, I think there will be demand 
And so I'm optimistic. Uh, I'm optimistic about its resilience because it is built on Ethereum, which is extremely resilient already. It could get much, much more so, but uh, already is extremely resilient. So I, I hope it doesn't come to a question of that. I hope, I hope we don't have to f ever really seriously ask if things that are as strong as the internet are resilient enough for what we're going through. I think by that point, uh, there will be a lot of a lot of grief in the world. Um, but in any case, I think I think that summarizes my answer. That if there's if there's if the technical means remains, then the demand I I expect will remain as well. Okay. I th I think I think I have a pretty solid grasp of of what you're about here and I think this is probably a pretty good place to start winding down the conversation but you seem like a you seem like a dude I could ask some random questions to and just kind of get an interesting answer so if you're game maybe we'll just do that for a minute 100% no yeah go for it <laughs> okay um I felt compelled to ask you this question, so I, I guess I'm just going to. Uh, what's your take on um, colonizing other planetary bodies or interstellar travel? Or do you do you suppose humanity is going to take to the stars? I think it's more likely that we do than the alternative. Um, whether we do it with rockets that burn basically gasoline, I'm not sure. I am, I am ex an extreme skeptic of mainstream science. The scientific institutions and publishers are basically as centralized and as uh, poorly incentivized as corporate media about uh, I'm trying, trying to recall these statistics off the top of my head, so I may be off a little bit, but I think 50% of the scientific publishings, scientific papers that get published come from the same six corporations, the same six scientific journals, and multiple editors-in-chief have come out recently and said, you know, a lot of what we publish is probably just false. And it took, it gives me no pleasure to come to this conclusion, but I can't avoid it after 10 years of being editor in chief, whatever. There's really no faith deserved in what is called scientific legitimacy. If you look under the hood, the ideals of science are great and the practice falls far short of it, just like in journalism. So I have no reason to believe that our technological abilities are as limited as they seem. Our physics is broken into three parts. We have quantum, Newtonian, and Einsteinian. And the scientific uh, impetus is to resolve these. And I am not convinced that after 100 years or so since Einstein and, and Bohr, that not a single person in the world has done that successfully. Uh, I've studied alternative theories of physics and found certain patterns that recur in uh, ones that seem to address these problems and divisions in a much more satisfying way. And uh, I, I don't believe that we, are, that we are this limited. I think the limits of known physics are artificial and to use another Marshall McLuhan quote, the biggest secrets are kept by public incredulity. So mm. it's not so much that the big secrets are not known, it's that they are not cool. So to translate that into English and summarize, I think human beings 
already have the technology to go to Jupiter like we're going to McDonald's. Okay. I suppose that leads me to another question, which is, what is your take on, let's call it uh, extra physical influence. You don't, you don't need to sugarcoat it. You don't need to hedge <laughs> it off. Bring it the hell on. Put it bluntly. Do you suppose that there are, do you suppose that there are forces that impact our psychology that exist outside of the physical realm, I guess is absolutely hundred percent. Mm. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And are those forces at war? Do you suppose? I think that would be a reasonable metaphor to use. Yeah, sure. Um, it's, I think there's a different kind of war happening in the non-physical than could be well analogized from the physical in the physical in a physical war between two armies the stronger one wins but armies are are uh forceful you have to feed them and they have a limited amount of power uh so they're not very efficient compared to something like gravity which you don't have to feed and it has infinite power. You throw it up, it throws it down, doesn't get a little tired. So while I, it makes sense to say that there is a spiritual war happening, the, the love side, the truly divine side of that war is the source of all power. So it's not a matter of who wins, who's going to win, can my army beat your army? It's kind of like gravity fighting a bird that's trying to fly into outer space. The bird has to use this force and the gravity is just chilling there going, I am inherently power. And even all the power that you have is just a derived twisted form of the power that I am and emanate. So yes, in a way there is, there is a war and in a way, there's, it's a, it's a different kind of, it's a different kind of a thing. And the, the spiritual world, I imagine, is as much of a jungle as physical jungles, if not more. And I don't recommend exploring the parts of it that uh, may not be safe or have any, any kind of confusion in them. The, the occult stuff is occult for a reason and there's power there. And I, I would recommend to anybody listening to tread real lightly and, and focus on, on what is demonstrably, timelessly, universally good. I think that is the only remotely safe relationship to the spiritual world. Hmm. <laughs> I kind of figured I was going to get a, a good answer out of you. There's this part of me that I feel compelled to bring ideas like this up more and more as time progresses or as cycles progress, I suppose, because one of the things I pay a lot of attention to is patterns and cycles and what I see in the landscape before me is not anything new. Maybe the sort of the, the plants are different, but the forest is the same. And I guess, and I don't want to tell people who they should be or what they should believe other than to say that they should believe in something and they should be something they should stand for something and that to choose to create and to choose to be on the side of creation rather than the side of destruction although there's we're sort of an amalgamation of both of those things as human beings it's 
you have to eat to live, devour to survive, right? But at the same time, where does the balance stand? Are you a misanthrope? Are you a nihilist? Are you, um, you know, I, I, I talk with my creator and he talks back to me. So maybe I'm fortunate in that way. Uh, and I have done a lot of exploring in that realm, but like I said, I don't want to tell people what they should believe, but it seems to me that there's a, such a, everybody has a God that they kneel to. And I, I would just suggest that, <laughs> you know, like there should actually be a God in a certain sense, like a, the sort of bowing to cultural influences or to a cult of personality or um, any of the things that are so readily proven to be temporary and, and imperfect. I, I don't know where I'm going with this. It's just that I want, I don't know, man. I just, this conversation that we've had, truth and trust are important things. Absolutely. And, and and to advance those things in any meaningful way is so hard because there's so many reasons or forces or, or incentives or, or momentum against being able to do that both on a physical or a, or a cultural or a spiritual level, all of them that we're in a place where there's all this turbulence, but the momentum isn't necessarily there's, there's a lot of momentum that, you know, my friend Roman McClay is a trippy dude and he says war is coming. And I, I, I tend to agree with that, I guess. And, and that's why I am rambling on about this. I just, I have a podcast and I have people's ear and I, you know, I just want them to, to think about who they are and, and what that means yeah. to them and to stand for it. Because if they don't, decide that for themselves is going to be decided for them. And this conversation has stirred up these ideas to a high degree for me because I have seen the lies. I have seen the deception. I've seen the manipulation. I've fallen prey to it myself and then had to really check and go, where did this idea come from in me? Why, yeah. why am I holding this idea and fighting for it? Do I believe it? No, I don't. I need to get this out of me. And how do I even do that? And that's, that's a lot of what I've been trying to do. And I guess maybe just as sort of a, to, to give you a parting shot, I don't know, man, what of all that ramble, I just sort of spilled out on you. What's, what's your take of all that? What do you have to say? Yeah. I believe truth is a force that exists. It's not a string of words. It's actually a thing. You can't sit on the word chair. A chair is a thing. Well, truth is a thing. And it's a, it's a good thing. I'm a huge believer in nonviolent protests as pioneered by Gandhi Satyagraha and uh, radical honesty and things like this. And even idea markets, what I've built there is basically a big fat wager that truth exists, that we may fight over it, but we will gradually, generally come to agree. And I think that's, you know, that's where our hope comes from. It comes from truth and its, its pursuit, its limitlessness, from imagination, from optimism. Optimism is a duty. You can't be out there influencing people with reasons you think, oh, this shit won't work out. I mean, how, how is that helpful? Your personal lack of faith is not thought leadership. It's a pathology. Get help. Don't infect me with it. Uh, so, yes, truth, truth is a real thing. I'm literally betting all of my work on it. And, um, and optimism is a duty. I'm not exactly sure how those two things are, are related, but uh, that's kind of my gut response to uh, what, you, what you've just said to me. <laughs> well, Mike, <laughs> this conversation took some very interesting turns. Yes, sir. And 
I like what you're doing. Thanks I think so it's a great idea. I hope it works. In fact, I think, I think you've found yourself um, a new evangelist because I, I, th- I feel like we've connected on a level and, and, and I'm, I'm picking up what you're putting down. And I want to thank you for taking the time to come on and let me poke at you and, and to share your ideas and to share a bit of your soul here at the end, even with, with me and with the people who are going to participate in this podcast. And, um, are there any, is there anything else you feel like you'd like to add on to the conversation here before we bring it to a close? I just want to say I appreciate it and I knew it was going to be fun. So uh, thanks very much. And I'm, I look forward to next time. I'd be happy to come back anytime. Very good. I like having repeated guests and I feel like we, we stepped through some doors, but only just on this one, then maybe it'll be a very different kind of conversation next time. <laughs> For sure. I'd love to get your take on democracy and all those things. I'm sure. That's <laughs> That'll be one to piss people off. That's for sure. <laughs> oh boy. I can't wait. We'll have a whole pissing people off episode where we just go down the list. Perfect. Well, listen, man, uh, I really appreciate it. It's been a great conversation. And um, if you're good, I'm good. I'm good, man. I'll see you on Twitter. Okay. In that case, this has been the Logo Centrifugal Podcast. I've been Chance Lunsford. You've been Mike Elias. And this has all been Allegedly, and we're out.